welcome back to Red Cedar Radar. I have another preview episode this week uh, since Michigan State faces Rutgers uh, on Saturday. I am joined by Richie Schneiderwright um, from <laughs> the Night Report, uh, which is Rutgers rival site, you know, the version of Spartans Illustrated. How are you today, Richie? I'm good. Can't complain. Getting uh, excited for tomorrow, despite the uh, supposedly other ugly weather. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I know. I saw that. Thanks so much yeah. for joining me. Um, yeah. Richie is a part of the Night Report, the publisher of the Night Report, but also has his hands um, in a couple other rival sites with Penn State and UConn. So you have mm-hmm. quite a decent background with rivals and recruiting and I would say football. Can you give a little bit of a rundown on how you kind of got started with rivals and what your career has been like up to this point. Yeah. So I actually, I was just a young kid in college at Rutgers. Um, I was on the message board as a fan back then. And I kind of just fell in love with uh, the game of football and and basketball too, I got to admit. But um, yeah, I just, I was a moderator for the message board for a couple years and in college. And then towards the end of my, uh, my college days, I kind of wanted to get more into writing and started doing journalism classes, starting doing all that stuff. And then I got picked up actually by 247 Sports uh, for a year. And they saw what I was doing there. And they just picked me up on the rival site as a recruiting analyst. I've covered recruiting since, I don't know, 2013, actually 2014. So approaching that 10 year mark now. Um, And eventually back in 20, I want to say it was 2020, 20, uh, no, maybe 2019, I think it was. And they they just offered me the uh, the Rutgers site since the the old publisher was leaving. So it just ended up working out really well. And since then, I've continued to move up. And now I'm the publisher of Rutgers uh, Rivals, UConn Rivals, and Penn State Rivals. So kind of a jack of all trades, I guess. Nice. Yeah, nice. So a Rutgers alumni. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Of course. <laughs> Let's jump right in to the game on Saturday. I kind of like to do offensive and decent defensive breakdowns with some players to watch. So let's start on offense. Tell me a little bit about um, Rutgers offense and what has been working for them in the past. Yeah. So it's a, it's a different look offense this year. They brought in a new offensive coordinator in Kirk Shiraka. They took him, uh, they kind of stole him, I guess, from Minnesota, although he was technically at Rutgers first back in Graciano 1.0, as I like to call it, his first tenure with the Scarlet Knights. Um, he didn't work out too well with Greg in the first tenure, but this second tenure around, I, I'd, I'd argue he's one of the better offensive coordinators in college football. He's, he's doing the simple things. He doesn't make it overcomplicated. Like most of these new OCs up and comers want to try to reinvent the wheel, get as fast as possible, do this and that, and probably do a little too much. Kirk's more of a, I'm going to make the smart passes, make the short passes and just kind of move the offense up the field and uh, kind of start that with the run game. And that's, that's where I kind of wanted to highlight. Um, that's kind of the ma- major highlight of Rutgers offense actually is the run game. And it's, it's kind of backed by Kyle Manungai, who's had quite the breakout year. He's averaging over five yards per carry um 487 yards on the season six touchdowns he's he's been the go-to guy so far but um when they can't get that run game going that's where the offense tends to struggle and that's where quarterback Gavin Wimsett's been better this season in his first year as legitimate starter um he was named QB1 before training camp even started so uh he's he's definitely still has some inaccuracy issues but he's he's getting better he went from 40 I think it was 45 percent last year which was the lowest completion percentage in all of college football um, to now, uh, I think he's up to almost 52%. So he's getting a lot better, but he still needs to work on a couple other things and, um, just kind of take care of the football. And that's, that's kind of how their offense runs. It's, it's mostly running, but you'll see occasional passes here and there. Okay. Yeah. Do you think that, um, Michigan state, since you talked with Ryan, the publisher of Spartans illustrated recently on your podcast, do you think that Michigan state has what it takes to stop Rutgers run game run game? Yeah, so we've done a lot of research over the past, uh, not even a week, I guess. It's only been since Monday. But uh, once that once that game ends on Saturday, we just kind of dive right into it to the next opponent. And it's almost like we're coaches, but not really. Um, but, yeah, we start evaluating, like, Michigan State's defense. And they, they're very big up front on the defensive line. And that's that's always caused issues for Rutgers, at least this season especially. And, and you saw it in recent games against Wisconsin and Michigan. The other three opponents that they've played were Northwestern, Temple, Wagner, um, so I, I don't really, um, who am I missing? I'm missing someone too. Northwestern Temple Wagner. Oh, Virginia Tech. So they're not as big as the big 10 bullies up front, but 
they've always those big 10 boys have kind of given Rutgers fits with the offensive line and they, they've had some struggles on kind of figuring out the right side of their line they've rotated in several guards they've rotated their left guard now over to right guard and Curtis Dunlap the right tackle is out for was out for significant time they won't say out for the year but it's getting pretty close to that point um they've they've rotated in a backup right tackle now they have a new right tackle in Reggie Sutton who's originally predicted not even to play this season so it's a it's definitely a work in progress and I think that's kind of where Michigan State has to attack if they want to stop this run game but it's it's going to be weird because like I said before Kirk Scirocco the offensive coordinator likes to likes to make things simple and I, I think if he, he's not he's not dumb he's obviously getting paid a lot, a lot of money to coach football but I think uh, he should be able to design plays around that defensive line it's just a matter of them being able to block up front and that that might be the determining factor for this one. Yeah. Anything else to add about the offense before we switch to defense? Um, I'd, I'd highlight one other player. So it's not like they don't have a pass game at all whatsoever. They do. Um, it's not the greatest in the world, but the only really big name player on the right on the, out of the wide receiver core or the skill positions, I would say, is Jaquay Jackson. He's actually a D two All American that transferred up from uh from that level, and people question if he can make that jump. But all these college programs like Colorado, Miami, Texas A and M. Um, Florida all offered him scholarships right out of the portal. So, I mean, he definitely has a lot of potential. He has yet to technically score a touchdown uh, for the Scarlet Knights, but he's also their leading receiver. So he's he's probably their best deep ball threat. So I definitely keep an eye on him if you're going to keep an eye on the wide receiver core this weekend. Yeah, good to know. Okay, switching to defense. Um, I saw a little stat that Rutgers is ranked 10th nationally in what's called like stop rate. So it just means like gets the other team to, Mm -hmm. you know, turn the down, turn the ball over on downs, punt or, you know, turnovers in general. So having a decent season on defense, tell me a little bit more about some names to watch on Rutgers defense. Yeah. So, I mean, just starting with the defense, I would say this is just Greg Schiano's bread and butter. He's, he's been a defensive coordinator his whole life. Every time he's had a D in been a head coach, he's always had a really good defense. You could take away maybe some of those defensive coordinator years at Ohio state, but he's, he's always just had a really stout um, attacking defense. Um, they're, they're only giving up about 14 points per game. They've been in almost just about every game so far, even the Michigan game. I know they ended up losing by, I think it was 20. Um, they, they were at halftime only down by, I think it was 10. So they, that, that's a very good Michigan team, mind you. Um, but yeah, no, I, I would say the biggest names to watch would probably be the edge rushers in Aaron Lewis and Wesley Bailey. Um, I think they're combined for the team lead in sacks currently. Yeah. They both have three each. Um, last year, Wesley Bailey was kind of a breakout candidate and only had three and a half and led the team this year. Now they're, they're getting to the quarterback a lot more. Um, Aaron Lewis last season technically didn't lead um actually he did he led the country in quarterback hits but couldn't turn those into sacks this year he's starting to turn those into sacks um their defensive line overall they they also have some solid interior players in Mayan Ahana too who's a Minnesota transfer Isaiah Eiton who came in this offseason via uh via the portal from uh, Ole Miss who is uh just a massive human being he's a legit like 6'4 6'5 320 like he's just a, a scary looking dude he's that we like to call him that first guy off the bus type of type of guy. Like you just want to strike that fear in the opponent. But other than that, I'd, I'd probably say the linebacker core has been pretty solid. Tyreen Powell does a little bit of everything. He's probably he's going to probably hear his name called quite a bit on Saturday. He's a surefire tackler, sideline to sideline guy. And he's also really good in coverage. And then this season, they kind of expanded his game a little bit and making him a little bit more of a pass rusher from that linebacker spot. Uh, he also has two sacks on the season force fumble fumble recovery so he, he's doing a little bit of everything and then in terms of the secondary it's probably the unit that worries me the most because their top corner has been struggling a little bit in max melton so I, i'm intrigued to see if michigan state can exploit that or even exploit him a little bit more um as teams have done so far but robert longer being cornerback two on the other side has been like a complete lockdown and he, he's a former two-star no one really expected anything out of him and he's played significant snaps since since he's been to campus uh, I want to say it's been three years now okay so similar question to when we talked about the offense do you think that Rutgers defense can shut down Michigan State's kind of wobbly offense that they've had recently 
Yeah, I'm, I think they can, especially because it sounds like Michigan State's kind of in a little bit of a quarterback controversy. I, I know it sounds like the backup's probably going to start, and you could correct me if I'm wrong there, but um, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see how they do against him because Rutgers, historically under Shiano, has always had struggles against backup quarterbacks, and it sounds weird to say that out loud, but every time there's been a backup quarterback in the Big East days, even recently, we've seen like some issues with backup quarterbacks and it's like uh, Virginia Tech's backup came in and wanted to say early first quarter after they knocked out the QB one and he lit them up on offense. So it's I don't know if it's just a preparation issue or something like that, but um, I'm, I'm a little little nervous for Rutgers for that sake. But uh, I, I do think they'll be able to stop the run game. And I think Nathan Carter is a really good back. Um, like I mentioned before, I've covered UConn for quite some time, so I, I'm pretty familiar with him. A little shocked he was able to bounce back the way he did because that was a significant shoulder injury a few seasons ago. But, um, yeah, I, I think Rutgers should be able to stop their run game. It's the pass game that really scares me and, and the unknown of the backup quarterback. I think you're right. I, I think that our Kate Hauser is going to start. I obviously don't know that mm-hmm. for sure, but it, yeah, everything's pointing in that direction. Um that's interesting about the struggles with the backup. And I wonder, like you said, if it's just like the there's less film on that guy. They don't know much about mm-hmm. him. Like they don't know what exactly to expect. Um, so I'll be curious now about that, too. That's a fun yeah. fact that I did not know about Rutgers football. I, Maybe not it so makes fun. No I sense. don't know. <laughs> like, it, it makes no yeah. sense. Like I, I, I get it. You got to. And Chiano said it in his presser this week. I'm going to prepare for both. But it's just I, I don't know what it is. There's just not film, like you said, or. Mm-hmm. or something else but it's just they catch him off guard and it's like oh my god this kid's actually a lot better than we thought and, and it's happened time and time again so hopefully yeah for Rutgers sake like I said it doesn't happen this weekend yeah we will see I don't I mean we've seen Caden Hauser you know occasionally and mm-hmm. I kind of know how he did during training camp and stuff but obviously that's a long time ago so we shall yeah. see if he does get the start how it goes um yeah it will be interesting to see what they decide because everything's pointing that way, but I could see Harlan Barnett still going with Noah Kim at the, like right before the game. So yeah. Up in there. Okay. uh, So (laughs) right, right. Let's talk specific predictions for Saturday. What are Mm -hmm. your thoughts? Do you have a score prediction? If not, how do you think it will end at least? Uh, Yeah, no, I definitely do. Uh, I don't know what to expect from this game, especially because this is the second week in a row. And, and Greg Schiano brought this up too this week. This might be, I think, and I did the math on this. I believe Rutgers is the only team in the Big Ten that's taking on opponents that are back-to-back weeks that are coming off bye weeks. I, I don't know if that's just the Big Ten. He kind of threw a little shade at the Big Ten saying, like, hey, like this, we're the only team that gets this? Kind of weird. but um, So I, I do think Michigan State getting that bye week, especially with that coaching controversy over there now, um, is like the biggest helpful thing in the entire world because you can kind of just sit there, get everything under control, kind of simplify the playbook, figure out some things you want to do on offense and defense. But um, combine that with the weather, which expected to be extremely ugly. It's supposed to be thunderstorms, windy, rain. Um, Rutgers struggling to pass as is. Uh, I do think Rutgers has the better defense, though, and I think that's going to be the deciding factor. So, so I'm looking right now. I, I have Rutgers 20-14 to 14 beating Michigan State. I do think it's going to be close. I know it's a six. Uh, I actually forget what the spread is. I think it's four and a half. So that would be Rutgers covering for the f- sixth time in six games. So or six or seventh time in seven games. So um, they're great, great team. Good teams win. Great teams cover. But I think Rutgers is able to do both this weekend. Okay, and then looking ahead to Rutgers season overall, mm-hmm. how do you think things will pan out for them? And kind of you know overall. What do you think their end percentage will be? So right now they're sitting at four and two. Um, if they get this one, this is almost like a must win if they want to get to a bowl game. Um, because the next two would be Michigan State and Indiana. You need those two. That would be six wins on the season. And then after that's when the gauntlet comes. That comes every year for, for Rutgers. And it's Ohio State, Iowa, Penn State, Maryland. And Maryland's pretty good this year. Ohio State's obviously great. Penn State's pretty good this year. Iowa's got a stout defense, and I, I honestly don't know if Rutgers gets another win past that I, uh, Indiana game on October 21st. So if you want to get to a bowl game like they, they're kind of striving for right now, you need to get this win this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for my last question, I just wanted to talk about something that popped into my mind as you were talking about kind of 
your career timeline. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't give you this question beforehand. Sorry to spring no, it on you. Good. But talk to me a little bit about how you, from your perspective, working at Rivals and you know, 247 for a little while, but um, mm -hmm. how you have seen the landscape of NIL and all of that stuff change the game of college football. Because I imagine you've kind of had a front row seat with recruiting stuff to see mm -hmm. how that has come in into play much more. Um, so just to, I guess, talk to me about your perspective on that. I'm just curious. Yeah, it, it's definitely interesting. It's, it's changed the game a little bit because now you're seeing some new power players like, like the Texas A&Ms of the world who's who always recruited well, but now they're recruiting really well. And Miami's kind of out there about NIL as well. Um, but it, Miami's kind of the, the, the sh focal point of how it always doesn't work because or even Texas A&M, I guess you could argue too. Um, you could spend as much money as you want on kids, but at the end of the day, you still need, still need decent coaching. And that's why Jimbo Fisher is under fire. Mario Cristobal is under fire. But I also think it's brought some new players to the table, even like those mid-level guys. Like Rutgers Collective isn't at the bottom. It definitely started out at the bottom, I'll tell you that much. It was, it was ugly to begin. But um, it's, it's like a mid-level collective now, and it's, it's looking pretty solid. You see it a little bit on the basketball front more than football, and it's easier to rebuild those type programs. I mean, right now they have the number two recruiting class in the country for basketball, and it could be number one if they get the number three recruit in the country to pair with the number two recruit in the country. So it is it is a little interesting. My biggest pet peeve about it, though, I'd probably say is it's it's legal now. These kids can talk about it, but they refuse to talk about it still. Like, I, I know you don't want to put those numbers out there because it's you don't want the quarterback to know that the offensive tackle is making this and the running back to know that the other running back's making this because then it's a whole – crazy controversy among the team locker room issues and all that so I, I give some coaches credit for handling all that stuff I think it's insane it's hard and then the, the other downside I don't like is like when it comes to recruiting it it gets really shady with some people like you'll see some programs like last minute right before signing day and it's like oh he was supposed to go to Auburn he told me he was going to Auburn loved Auburn and then all of a sudden he's going to Tennessee now like what happened there and it's like hey bud I heard he got like 600 700 K and it's like oh okay that that would that would make sense so I, I would do it too <laughs> like but uh it's it's definitely interesting the whole perspective is kind of crazy and I I know it's not all collective based but collectives are playing such a factor and it's the whole the whole thing is just it's honestly the wild wild west and especially when it comes to the portal because and I, I've talked to multiple coaches about this not just locally but um when it comes to offensive linemen, you you talk to players and it's like a random G5 offensive lineman who has maybe seven games under his belt that started six last year is going to get like 400K automatically just for being a decent offensive lineman. So it's uh, between quarterbacks and OL, I would think those are the two highest paid uh, transfer guys currently. And it's it's kind of trending that way with high school too. Do you think this model of kind of how things are going is unsustainable? by programs and collectives. I just feel like numbers are getting larger and larger. Mm -hmm. And I guess I don't know, maybe interest in, you know, NIL and, and big donors giving lots of money is also growing because they mm -hmm. want their programs to succeed. But do you think at a certain point, things will scale back? I thought about this for a long time. And I honestly think I don't, it's weird. So a lot of these like lower level programs that don't have money are going to just be going to be pissed off. Like they're going to be like, I can't do this constantly. Like, no, duh. Like, but uh, a lot of these other programs, like look at the big 10 money, like there's going to be revenue sharing eventually and they're going to have the advantage. So like Michigan States of the world, Rutgers, et cetera, et cetera, are all going to have that crazy advantage to say, Hey, come play for us. We play a national schedule from, it's going to be from noon to like midnight. And it's going to be brutal for us as like coverage guys, but and girls, sorry. Um, but it's it's just I the money's now gonna always gonna be there, I think. I don't think it's ever gonna change. And then you have some of these other guys who are like mid level mid level donors that wanna play GM and they honestly can, hey, you wanna be Jerry Jones for, for a year? Go ahead, be Jerry Jones, throw us a couple mil and we'll we'll you could pick the roster. Go ahead, you could pick the quarterback too. Um, so I do think it's a little bit sustainable and it's it's been happening forever. Now it's just in the public eye, and that's that's the bigger issue. Um a lot of people complain and they're like, this just came out. This is, I don't know why this is happening. Like this is ruining the sport. And I'm like, it's been going on for like 40, 50 years. Like you don't think Jim Beheim was paying people at Syracuse and I could name a bunch of others if you really want. But um, 
yeah, they've been paying players for years. Now it's just in the public eye, and now it makes people a little upset knowing like, oh, they're getting this much, they're getting that much, and it's. I think it's just going to continue to raise, like you said. Any other things that you want to say about the Rutgers game? I know we went off topic for no, a second. I just was curious. Um, anything else that you want to say about Rutgers before we end our episode here? Um, I will say uh, if, if you guys are coming to the game and you're a Michigan State fan, it's, it is a little um, – it's, it's a good tailgating scene. I don't know how good it's going to be tomorrow just because of the weather. I know a lot of, fair, ironically, fair weather fans uh, will just not show up. Um, in terms of parking, parking is very hard to get. So if you don't have a parking pass, I'd highly recommend getting one. If you don't want to step in mud, don't get blue or yellow. Get the red one or get the black parking lot or the green. Just anything that's not blue or yellow because it's just going to be mud pit after mud pit. Um, and that that is what it is. That's like everywhere, I guess. But overall, it's a pretty good atmosphere. It's a good game day experience. Um, I, I just think this is going to be a really close one. I could honestly – I know I predicted Rutgers to win, but I could see it going the other way as well. Uh, like I said, Michigan State has that bye week, and that's going to play a significant factor. Um, I know a lot of people think like bye weeks don't really mean stuff, but when, in, like I said before, when you have a new head coach, interim head coach midseason, it's the most important week of the season probably. And um, Harlan Bennett, he, he said it before, the win would mean a lot. So, or Har- Har- Barnett, sorry, um, it would it would mean a lot to them, and they they kind of need something to get this program going again. Yeah, I thought the bye week was perfectly timed um, for mm-hmm. everything that has been going on. So yeah. I think that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, yeah, no this problem. episode will be on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Um, we will have a recap episode after the game. Brendan and I will be coming together again to kind of recap how things went for Michigan State on the road against Rutgers. Uh, Game kicks off at noon. And thanks so much for listening. Bye.